Hello, my name is Uver Walker Hannon. I'm a co-lead of the African American Affinity Group and welcome to our session for WE21. I'm going to share a brief presentation. In terms of our presentation, the title is The Next Generation of Black Girl Magic. Goals are important in any endeavor. They're critical at work and good to have outside of work too. Our goal or aspiration today is to inspire you with information on the next generation of Black Girl Magic. I also encourage you to engage and chat with other attendees. So let's get started. So first, let's look at our learning objectives. We're going to identify and list the issues that impact why Black women are underrepresented in engineering degree programs. Next, we'll evaluate and examine techniques and tools that have influenced the panelists to pursue engineering degrees and continue towards engineering professions. We'll also create a plan to volunteer with an organization that has plans to address the identified issues that impact the underrepresentation of Black women in engineering degree programs, or to help better serve as a mentor or sponsor. But let's continue by looking at information regarding the affinity group itself. The African American Affinity Group of SWE is a space for women engineers who identify as African American and or Black to build a community with support and resources. This is done by hosting events and having activities where individuals from this affinity group can network, learn skills, and help influence future generations of women engineers who identify as African American and or Black. Currently, we have 553 members in Facebook alone, and you can also look for our presence on LinkedIn, Instagram, and also Twitter as of now. The structure of our group is what you can see on the slide. So we actually have a layer of leadership right above the DEI affinity group lead. I'm one of the co-leads, or it's going to be another co-lead, and we have other leads in various roles. There's the Cultural and Heritage Month lead, who is in charge of creating activities regarding Black History Month as one example. We have a collegiate engagement lead, mentoring leads we're looking for, community outreach lead, awards lead, conference lead. We also have a social media lead as well. This is just a sample of the organizational chart for the affinity group. Now, in terms of looking into what we can do as a part of our upcoming discussion, I'd first like to highlight information that's going to help us continue what we're going to see as a part of this presentation. So let's aspire to have a discussion to inspire. So we're going to hear from the leads of the African American Affinity Group by having a panel discussion in a roundtable format. So that means we're going to not have a moderator, it'll just be a conversation between the leads. You'll see this being recorded coming up soon. We're going to have some themes that are present in the panel questions. So what are these themes? We're going to share our experiences, reflect on the past, explore the present, and look forward to the future. So with this in mind, we're going to get to our panel. So before we get to our full panel discussion, what we're going to do is each of the leads will introduce herself by giving her name, her role with the affinity group, maybe what they're doing in terms of their profession, and maybe try to identify one to two facts about herself. So I'm going to stop sharing the presentation and I invite some of the leads from the African American Affinity Group to come on camera and introduce themselves and then we'll get into the panel discussion. So we have, I see my colleagues, they look wonderful. Thank you for joining. 
and I'm going to go in alphabetical order by last name. So we have my colleague Nina. Nina, please introduce yourself. Hello, and hello to everyone at um, the conference. So my name is Nina Ahuja. I am the social media lead for the African American Affinity Group. I am a program manager here in San Diego. Um, a couple of random facts about me. Um, I did my schooling in the Midwest, um, specifically my engineering degrees um, from University of Illinois at Chicago and the University of Michigan at Dearborn for my um, master's. Um, as far as, I think that should cover it as far as degrees um, or as far as interests. So civil engineering and then industrial engineering as well, so. So helpful. Thank you very much, Nina. And next we have our colleague, Deborah. Hello, everyone. I'm delighted to be with you today. My name is Deborah L. Coleman. I reside in Seattle, Washington, and I work for the Boeing company as a software engineer. I went to school for my undergrad back east in Boston, and then I came out to work for Seattle out here on the West Coast. I went to University of Washington for my master's degree and then back to BU for another master's degree. So I'm really delighted to be with you today and I'm looking forward to a great discussion. Excellent, thank you, Deborah. And hello to the audience once again. So my name is Luvera Walker-Hannon. I'm a co-lead of the African American Affinity Group. I'm an application engineering team lead with MathWorks and I currently reside in Boston, Massachusetts. In terms of universities, one of the schools I went to was Boston University. So share that connection with Deborah. In terms of an interesting fact about myself, my first name is actually made up. So it's a combination of my parents' first names, Lewis and Guinevere. They divided and combined and you get me. So with that in mind, thank you to my colleagues, my fellow leads for the African American Affinity Group. And we're going to get into a panel discussion. So the panel discussion has a focus on the next generation of black girl magic. And from that title, we're trying to explore questions that can help influence the next generation of black women engineers to possibly pursue studying engineering and or pursue professions in engineering, or possibly STEM at large. So with that in mind, we have a few questions that we're going to cover. So one of the items that I like to think about is kind of where we came from, what was part of our journey. And one of the questions that comes to mind for me is, you know, how did each of us learn about your particular STEM field? And I think that each of us has probably a very unique journey. And I'll call on at least I'll start with Nina to see if you can provide some insight. Then we'll go with Deborah and myself. So Nina, please. Sure, so I found out about the field of civil engineering uh, while I was growing up. I probably was about eight or 10, somewhere around there. Um, I just knew, I, I come from a family of engineers, like on my dad's side, there are quite a few. And my dad was a computer engineer and as much as I was interested by computers, I didn't think I wanted to do those for the rest of my life. And then my mom is a nurse and my mom's side is all like helping professions. And I just didn't want to do anything in the medical field either. So I just did what most people did. Um, I took a career assessment and I remember architecture, civil engineering and actuary came up. Um, I know very odd, different, Field. And so uh, civil engineering kind of was the one that interested me out of that. And as I got older, I didn't really find anything else that interested me anymore. So I kind of just stuck with it and finished my degree and then realized that there were other fields that I liked a little bit more. And so that's where the industrial engineering part came in. So I know my route was probably a little atypical, but it's okay. I got to where I wanted to be. And that's what counts in my opinion. Excellent. Thank you very much, Nina. And Deborah, what about yourself? I was actually in a program that still exists on the West Coast called MESA, 
math, engineering, science achievement. And I started in the program in junior high school. And so we would have field trips, we would have speakers that would come in and they would teach us about uh, or talk to us about engineering. And we also were enrolled in a different curriculum um, that was geared toward getting into engineering um, as an undergraduate student. And so that's where my first exposure to engineering came from. This is helpful. Thank you very much, Deborah. And uh, for myself, I didn't think about engineering fully when I was younger, so in elementary school, but I at least knew that I wanted to do some sort of STEM role. So for example, for the longest time when I was younger, I wanted to be an archeologist. And after that, it was a speech language pathologist. So there was a theme where I wanted to do something with data and analysis. And I finally became interested in biomedical engineering towards my, probably the end of my senior year in high school. And at the time, I think language wise, I don't know if I actually said the words biomedical engineering, but I knew some engineering discipline. So it's, it's been an interesting journey, but I think like most of you, it's been an interesting journey. So, so thank you for sharing. So I think the takeaway message is each of us probably has a very interesting journey to where we are today. You'll see this with the three examples that you have here. Now, in terms of the journey itself, one of the other topics that stands out for me is after you knew about the particular field that you were interested in, then the next step I think for all three of us was to go to college. And I don't know about the two of you, but one of the biggest concerns I had about college was trying to fund my education. And it makes me think, you know, I wonder how, how did you finance your college education? Do you have any suggestion or suggestions or hints for the audience members? So I'll start with Deborah first and then Nina. Okay, my audio went out a little bit, but I believe the question is what are suggestions or hints you have for someone that's interested in going into engineering? Actually, it was to help out with how did you finance? Finance. Great. Your education, yes. Great. Thank you. So, uh, well, my parents paid. I, um, and it's pretty interesting because the first year, uh, as all parents are, they're very concerned about money. And my dad wanted me to, he said, wherever's the cheapest is where you're going. <laughs> and so I actually, my freshman year, I actually had a lot of scholarships from uh, different community groups, church, et cetera. And so with like scholarship money, the cost of, I went to Boston University undergrad, which was a pretty penny, but the cost that compared to some of the other schools that I um, applied and got into, which were UC Davis. Okay. And let's see for a moment, just to check in. Okay. So our colleague, Deborah. You have to continue to apply for scholarships unless it is, you know, unless they're multi-year scholarships, you have to continue to apply for them. So a lot of them are first year scholarships only, which was the case with me. So yeah, they had to, you know, fit the bill the next three years. So, but there are lots of financing options available if they're scholarships, work steady. Now I did work, I worked every year I had my own business the first part of freshman year, and then I'd had work study jobs on campus, uh, my remaining terms and every summer I worked as well. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you, Deborah. And Nina, what about yourself? I did have a few scholarships, but I think they were pretty much a drop in the bucket when it came to the overall cost for my undergrad degree. Um, so to help supplement that, like Deborah, I worked as well, um, usually retail jobs, or um, I also did have an internship, which was like a, it was more of a research assistantship um, where I got to actually study at the University of Puerto Rico, Maya was, and end up doing a couple of research studies, um, two summers that I did there. 
Um, the rest of it was loans, um, which 15 years later, I'm still looking at, uh, as most people are probably out there as well. Um, but yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, Nina. And I know for myself, I'm probably in the same predicament as both of you in terms of the combination of, yes, there were some scholarships, but had to also work and also take out loans. Based on the time frame when I went to school, I, I've paid off my student loans, but I still think that I have to look future forward because I would at some point like to return to school. So the question is, you know, how do you fund that? And my life has changed since then, but these were very helpful, you know, topics. And also in some cases, maybe in terms of like telling people to apply for scholarships, that's one item. But I think we're also mentioning, you know what, some of us may have to work while we're in school too. And that's- Yeah, and I think that might be a really good question to discuss next is like, because yeah. I know for me, I worked retail and that was good, but it wasn't until I started getting my internships and co-ops that I really start making more money or significantly more than working retail. So um, both of us, all of us mentioned how we got our roles like while we were working. So I kind of would love for us to kind of talk about next um, how you landed internships, research assistantships, full-time roles um, that were more so in the field. I think that might be a good thing to kind of discuss. Yeah, no, I agree, Nina, absolutely. And I guess I'll start and then Deborah, feel free to, to jump in. So I know for myself, at the time when I went to school, I must admit, I think there's a generational component. There wasn't this big, big emphasis as much as I'm hearing now about internships. So a lot of the time I was working in a role that may not have had a direct connection to what I was studying. But what I did wind up doing is I did try to join different professional organizations to try to be aware of the different topics that were of interest and also different roles. And one of the reasons why I mention that is because I joined one particular professional organization where they're pointing out that my current company was going to have on-campus interviews. And that's how I found out. And I went to an on-campus interview to try to connect with my current company. I did not get selected during the first round, which was in the fall, but during the spring of the following year, I did get selected for an interview. But I think there's something to be said about having some sort of connections kind of outside the classroom. So that that's what happened to me. I didn't do as much in terms of internships. I did work though, while I was in graduate school. But other than that, not a lot of internships. And, and Deborah, I'm curious, what about yourself? Um, back to the program I was in, in junior high and high school, Mesa, one of the, like we had summer school. And one of the things that they really stressed was building your resume. I don't care if it's like babysitting, cutting the lawn, whatever it is, because it it builds it up and you start to, the critical thing is like, what skills did you use? And so they also partnered with companies to provide summer jobs once you got into high school, but there's still an age requirement. So, and I, I had started school early, so I only got to work my senior year, but my senior year, I worked for Pacific Telephone Company as an engineering intern before I went, my before my freshman year of college. Um, and then in the summer, I worked, uh, I went back to Sacramento. I worked at Sac Sacramento Army Depot. So I've worked jobs like anything from a clerk typist, uh, working in college, little arts, just office administrator. And my junior year, BU started a program. They started the co-op program and I participated in that. So my junior year, year, I took a semester off and I went to work for General Dynamics in San Diego. And that was an extremely good experience. And so, you know, you, when you have co-ops, you're delayed, right? It may take you longer um, because you have to, you took that semester off to go work and you can come back and work the summer, which I did to try to graduate on time or 
you know, you can extend your time out undergrad. Um, so I've done a lot of Sacramento's a government town. <laughs> and I also, when I worked, went to school in the summers in Boston, I worked downtown in US Customs. Um, and then I'd come back and I, in the evenings I'd take classes. So I've had a variety of jobs, um, technical, as well as more office or administrator while I was going to school. And, but my freshman year, I had a job, I typed papers. Okay. All righty, I guess I'll go ahead. Um, I mentioned my undergrad researching um, that when I found out, um, like Lou, I ended up doing a lot of um, exploring other student um, engineering organizations. And that's how I found out about that particular role. Um, and as Deborah kind of mentioned, a lot of these opportunities like internships and even um, scholarships, you have to reapply. And so that's what I did to go back the second um, summer. Um, aside from that, everything else was more um, networking. So talking to people within the College of Engineering and letting them know what my ambitions were and just letting the, like they would connect me with different people because I was well known and respected in the college. So it worked out really well. And that's that's excellent. No, and this is helpful once again, I think, for the audience to know that, you know, despite the three pathways, all of us have wound up in our current roles. And all of those steps helped each of us out in some way. So that is helpful. The avenue that people may explore if they're considering graduate school is does your company pay? Or even if you start working at a company and you don't have your degree, will they help you pay to finish your degree, you know, your undergraduate degree? So that's also um, an option to explore. I know my Boeing, the Boeing company. Okay, so let's do the following. So I know that there are quite a few other questions that, you know, we could explore and, you know, we may do some, some jumping around the questions. How does that sound? Great. Okay, excellent. So one of the topics that is near and dear to my heart is, you know, being a Black woman in tech, and specifically having a STEM role or studying a STEM topic. In a lot of cases, you tend to be one of the few, not the only one in the room where you're in, whether it's a virtual room or in person. And one of the topics that's near and dear to my heart is talking about hair. So the question is, what do you think about hair and specifically the workplace? I'm curious if you know, either of you would like to kind of share your experiences related to that topic? Because I think that's important for the next generation to kind of know about and be aware of. And I guess I'll start with Nina and then we'll go to Deborah, then I'll add in a few words. So Nina. I think it's very, it's a very applicable topic because I think a lot of us think of engineering as a very conservative workplace. Um, I think stereotypically it tends to be. And so we think you know, if our hair isn't straight, there's going to be a problem. And very few of us um, have hair that is naturally straight. Um, for me, um, when I was doing my researching, my hair was in its, it was in a chemically straightened state. So I would do extensions. I think a lot of the time since I was away from home, um, and I just didn't want to worry about, oh, let me find a salon or something like that. I did put braids in for the summer, which was not a huge deal. Um, then when I went for internships in 
graduate school, I ended up wearing my natural hair, which was like a teeny weeny Afro at that point. Um, and I didn't find it to be problematic at all. And I was the only one in the entire building, let alone the department. Um, so I, it wasn't an issue, never came up as a problem or anything like that. Um, and then kind of kept that going forward since. So um, definitely have had natural hair every now and again, I'll wear braids or twist different kinds of extensions or whatnot. Um, I think it's gotten to the point where now as a program manager, I feel very confident in my hair and to the point in which I would consider doing locks and not thinking that it would jeopardize my profession. Now I will admit I did feel a level of insecurity um, around it thinking, oh no, if, if it's not a certain way, I'm not gonna get this role. And I've kind of gotten to the point where if I'm not accepted for how I have been created for whatever reason, may it be the way that my hair grows out of my hair or m how deep my skin complexion is, whatever it may be, then that's just not the role I want. Thank you, Nina. And I share a lot of similar experiences with you. And I'm curious to hear from Deborah. Deborah, is there anything you would like to share and add? Well, my hair was always just natural. Um, growing up, I would get my hair pressed for Christmas, Easter, um, going back to school pictures. But when I went to like when I went to BU, so there's different. So there's Northern California and it's like laid back, right? Easy going. So when I went to the East Coast, all of the black girls had their hair permed and, and they were like, well, you don't have a perm. I'm like, what's a perm? I had never heard of it. And so I did get my hair permed and it was just like, I was just like, oh, I look cute. I look cute. Um, and so I always had my hair permed, but I, I am cheap, right? And and that's a cost. And so then I started doing it myself. And so I have um, Crohn's, Crohn's disease. And after learning more about it and taking a bigger um, view on health and really making my health top priority, like the more natural you are, the more healthy and better it is for myself with Crohn's. And so now I just live as natural as possible. So I did the big chop. I've done a couple, not a, I've done two big chops. And so when I first did it, <clears throat> I had my hair just going back in cornrows and no, no one really said anything. Some people were like, oh, that's different. Mm. Um, and cause my company is very conservative, right? And there were very few black women that had that were wearing natural hair. And I just embraced it because it was so easy. Like at the time I was really heavily involved in CrossFit and you didn't have to worry about anything. You could just go, go to work, work out or whatever. And as it started growing out, then I started doing twists and I just loved them. I just thought that they, they were great. And it's very interesting. One time, I don't know what, it, oh, I was gonna cut my hair. So I flat ironed it, right? To just, it to be flat to cut. And I wore it to work and my boss was like, I love your hair. And so he like, he felt comfortable saying he loved it being flat and straight, but not saying, I don't feel that comfortable with, you know, like the cornrows or the twist. But I just continued because it was for my health. I loved it. It looked good. And I've been natural ever since. I think that was about 2008 or nine. And so I love it. It's very versatile. You could do so many things. Um, so, and, and it's me, right? Um, I used to <laughs> too much, but I used to dye it, but now, I mean, I haven't even dyed it. So it's just, um, I love it. And I think, and thank you for sharing Deborah. I think, you know, the two items that I'm taking away from what both of you shared and I share so many of the same experiences is, you know what, you both have gotten to the point where, you know what, I have faith in my technical abilities. And if an organization 
cannot accept me for the way that I wear my hair, that sounds like there may be a disconnect in terms of maybe being with that organization and, you know, making certain that you feel comfortable bringing your, I'm going to say your authentic self to that organization. And I, I share a lot of that with the both of you, because I think that if an organization was going to be upset that I wear my hair like this, I'm thinking, well, wait a minute, I'm doing a lot more than just wearing my hair like this, <laughs> but there's a brain up there and you're paying me for what's in my brain, I would think. So yeah, I, I think it's great. Thank you both for sharing. I know for myself, I was very concerned about changing my hair to this style, I have braids on the side. Some of you can see it, some of you may not. And one of the biggest items for me was switching over from having my hair where there was a, a lot of usage of relaxers for years and switching over and I'm like, uh-oh. And then my thought was, what are people at my job going to think? I also had a customer facing role. So I had to be in front of customers and it's been fine. It's been fine. And I think part of that comes from me saying, you know what, this is me. And saying, listen, I'm here to work with you. If you have any other issues, I really probably cannot help that, especially if you don't agree with the package that the you know, person is, is coming with. So, yeah. agree. Thank you. I definitely agree. Yeah. And I know I'm, I'm jumping around with a few questions. I'm trying to be kind of, you know, interested in the time factor that we have, but also trying to get in some, but I feel like interesting questions for that next generation to consider. And I wanted to ask, you know, Deborah or Nina, are there any questions that, you know, are coming to mind for you that you would like to ask? At the stage? I, um, I think one I had, and we kind of are looping it or can kind of guide into it because we're kind of talking about how I think with your response, Lou, and mine, that if the company we were working at couldn't accept us as an entire package, then, you know, it just wasn't a good, a good fit. So I think one thing I would like to explore aside from that interview where you're actually face to face with the person and they're seeing you you're getting them you're getting a feel for them what questions or um what what kind of way did you undergo your investigation to kind of find out how mature the company was with respect to just diversity and inclusion and those kind of efforts this is a great question. And uh, Deborah, I'm curious to hear your thoughts. And then I'll okay. share mine. For me, I didn't do any investigation. I needed a job. And <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what it was. Um, I, and I've always been one of few, right? Sometimes the only one. But I think you get used to it depending on where you went to undergraduate school, right? Uh, and even in some of your high school classes, uh, there weren't a lot of people that looked like you. And so it's, it's, it comes with the territory, right? Um, so I didn't do any investigation. Um, what was interesting, I've left Boeing twice, once to work for Moog, um, they're a Boeing supplier and wants to work for Intel. And Moog, of course, had significantly less Blacks, African-Americans than Boeing. And they were located in East Aurora, New York, outside of Buffalo. And I think the African-American population in East Aurora was like less than 1%. Mm. But um, I think Boeing definitely has done a great job and increasing their numbers of I've never had that experience before. So I so appreciated that, like that bonding. And I imagine like, how much more could we excel in this field if we had more instead of like only one go to math works, one go to Boeing, if there's two or three, right? Because you have that cohort 
and you have that camaraderie. And this is this is very helpful, Deborah. So I feel that I probably share something similar where I know at this time or at that time, my company didn't really have a lot of demographics information that was available. So what I did is I looked at the demographics of the city where the company was located to see, okay, what's going on? And those numbers were quite low. And I wanna say maybe it's within the range of what Deborah highlighted for the black slash African-American population, or you know maybe, maybe a little bit higher, but it wasn't a lot. So I think I prepared myself to be in the following situation. I will probably be one of the few black individuals, maybe in my department, probably throughout the company. And let me try to see how people treat me. And let me see if the company culture has a place for me. So I tried to approach it that way. I assumed because the number of individuals who identified as black and or African-American was a small number, I didn't think there were possibly any sort of employee resource groups at that organization. That has since changed, but at the time there, there wasn't any. And I said, you know, let me try this out. Let's see how this works. And, you know, it's worked for me where I've stayed at my company for quite some time. It's now 21 years and counting, but also they've gone through significant changes where there are now the creation of affinity groups. And I think that's helpful. But initially I couldn't really rely on any information from my company directly. It's more so related to demographics information about the town where my company was located. And I'm curious, what about yourself, Nina, with respect to this question? Great question. I think when I first graduated with my undergrad, that was something I was looking at, was looking at demographics for particular cities, just because most companies weren't publicizing that. Um, I think most recently, probably within the last three to five years, companies now publicize that. And I look for it, like with job searches, it's definitely something that I look for just because I've worked in settings where I've had like um, bosses or superiors who didn't quite like my hair. Like when I first did my big chop, there was panic um, of how I might present myself um, to the point in which I had um, my boss at the time bring out a pick and think if she could fix it, it would just be just right. Um, yeah, I, but yeah, it's over. So I try to just for the sake of my mental health, not put myself in kind of situations like that where I could actually be my authentic self. And I think I feel most safe being my authentic self when I have other people around me who look similarly, or at least are readily exposed to other people who look similarly to me. And that makes a lot of sense. And I know that we have time maybe for two questions. And I think what you just said resonated with me on so many levels where it made me think about the following topic. So the topic is, and it leads into a question, you know, what about mentorship? So do you find value, value in mentors? And have you found ones that you click with, especially with respect to, have you found mentors who may come from similar backgrounds to your own? I'm really curious about that. So let's see, I'm going to start with Deborah, then we'll, we'll switch over to Nina. Yes, I find extreme value in mentors as well as sponsors. Um, and I've had mentors for quite some time uh, at Boeing. And I would say I really began to understand the need and for sponsors probably later in my career than I wish I would have um, because sponsors can really open up doors for you, right? Um, but I've always had mentors and advisors. Uh, I think now it, young people are really in on that, right? 
setting up networking one-on-ones, really exploring what options there are, informational interviews. But I think they're key, right? Because you're coming into somewhere and you need help navigating. It's not like when you start school, you have a syllabus and you have a scoring rubric that says, if you do A, B, and C, you're gonna get this outcome. Here, you don't know what sort of outcome you're gonna get. And they could really help and guide you. Like they're not doing the work for you. You still have to do the work, but they can help give a lay of the land. And like, this is what would be beneficial for you to do. These are the people that would be beneficial for you to talk to, perhaps based on what you're interested in. Um, I think for my, my um, mentors for me were kind of hard to find. Like I had to find them a step specifically through like programs which would match you up with a mentor. Mm -hmm. And ones that I clicked with were ones where it was just trial and error um, and trying them on through these different partnerships and whatnot. And it's just a personality thing. It's a personality, but then also interest. You want ones who are actually going to be able to speak into you and align with your career goals or and be able to guide you appropriately. Uh, what I find best about some of the mentorships um, that I've had over the years is that realizing not all of them are going to be official are going to start off with that official partnership. Um, I have some previous bosses who have been absolutely instrumental in my growth over the last five to 10 years, um, as far as just being able to guide me and offer advice. So definitely, I think it's just up to you to kind of take those opportunities when they present themselves and to make the most out of them. And this is helpful, this is helpful. Thank you both Nina and Deborah. I think one theme that stands out based on what the both of you said is, you know what, your mentors and sponsors can come in many different ways and try to be flexible. And you also need to do possibly some exploration where you know you may connect with some people and you may not, but you know what, it happens and that's, that's standard and you may have to keep searching. That makes sense. And I think once again, I have a combination of experiences based on what the both of you have said. And you know, I, I don't think there's anything too different that I would highlight related to what each of you said. And let's look at, you know, two more questions actually. So one question I have is related to, for this, you know, next generation of Black Girl Magic. One of the things that I think we need to highlight is it's been a difficult year, I would say on a variety of levels, especially related to not just COVID-19, but all sorts of issues of various types. And related to COVID, I'm curious, you know, did anyone do any sort of job switch during COVID and how did it possibly compare versus a change pre-COVID? I'm curious, did that happen to, for any of us? And if that resonates with you, if that did happen, please answer. If not, just, you know, kind of sit back and listen. So anyone. I definitely did take place in the great resignation. Um, I And I think that's what they're pretty much calling this whole idea of changing jobs during this COVID time. I think for me, a part of it was just graduating. Like I graduated with my master's in um, 2019. I did have a role um, and it would not, so I kind of started before COVID actually happened because they wouldn't allow me to work remotely and just, in order for my work-life balance to kind of take place, I had to work remotely um, for that period of time. So I did resign. Um, and so then after that, I worked um, my own company along with um, some contract roles here and there until I found my current role. Um, how did it compare to pre-COVID? I definitely think it was a lot harder. It, was, it seemed like it was a lot more competitive um, just because it seemed like there were more people who were looking at the same time who may have been um, more qualified than I was for roles and were willing to take 
lower paying roles or lower qualifying roles than what they may have been able to land pre um, COVID or pre this in the interesting time. Um, but I think if anything, it definitely put more of an emphasis for me and my personal job search on researching and going after jobs that may have not been as well advertised if advertised at all. Okay, that's very helpful, Nina. And Deborah, I don't think you switched roles during COVID, but please, if you did add to what Nina said. No, I did not. I did not either. So <laughs> we, we are learning from you, Nina. And, you know, it takes a lot of bravery to do what you did, especially during the time frame. So I think that's another theme that we can take away related to this panel. You know, you may have to step out on your own. You may have to rely on your bravery to get to your next position. And that looks like that's the case, you know, in quite a few cases. That would happen. And here's the, the last question I'd like to explore. It is going to take some reflection. So if you think back five years ago, did you envision yourself where you are today? And I'm going to start with an answer. My answer is no, but in terms of elaborating. So five years ago, I, I've been with my current company, MathWorks, for 21 years, but I started in the application engineering group five years ago. And when I first started in the group, I would have no clue that I would become a team lead. I would not have no clue that I would have kind of the amount of influence and respect that I have. I, I wouldn't have any clue. So I definitely know I could not have imagined, not by far. And I'm curious from each of you, what are your answers? So. Dapper, what about you? You want to take a stab at it? Yeah. I, I'm not sure. I, uh, <laughs> I would definitely say no in the sense that I had left Boeing at the time, if we're at 2016, and I had returned to Sacramento. So I had thought that maybe I would still be in Sacramento, um, back where my mom is, but, um, but I returned back. And I think I returned back to Boeing with the new determination and focus um, to like, now you're a senior level engineer and how are you gonna finish out your career? Like, what are the goals that you really wanna buckle down and accomplish uh, before retirement? And so that's the place where I am now. That sounds cool. I think mm -hmm. five years ago, I had just, um, what I think is interesting for everyone to know is that in between my master's in engineering and my bachelor's in engineering, I did a complete 180 and I was a psychologist. So I actually had just five years ago quit my job as a psychologist and was getting ready to start my master's in engineering. And did I think that I would have been like at that point I was in Michigan and did I think I was going to finish the degree in online from California and end up as a program manager? No, I did not think so. I don't think I could have envisioned myself here. I think it probably would have been one of my wildest dreams just because I didn't even know what a project manager was, let alone a program manager at that time. And so, but after I learned about it and everything, I was like, oh, this is what I wanted to do all this time, lead teams and get things done, problem solve. So I think it was just like, I couldn't imagine it, but it was my best dream, so. And I, I think that's great. I think that's sums it up, I think, for probably quite a few of us. That's excellent. And I wanna say thank you to both Nina and Deborah for your replies during this panel. And if you could stay with me, I'm going to have just a few closing items before we end our session for week 21. So I'm going to share my screen. Give me a quick second. OK. 
Okay. So I believe you can see my presentation and we have a wrap up slide that we're seeing right now. So as a part of this wrap up, there are a few items I wanted to have the audience think about and consider. So what can be done after this panel? I think one item is to listen and learn as far as listen to your colleagues. In this case, Black women in engineering, Black women in STEM at large, where they may be sharing experiences with you and see if you can learn from them, see if you can help in some way. Explore serving as a mentor sponsor. You heard from many of the panelists that that was helpful to them, that was vital to them to help either with their education or their roles with an organization. Revisit and think about hiring practices. One of the items that we spoke about as a part of this panel was hair and how our hairstyles may have impacted our relationships at work. So that's one component in terms of hiring, you know, thinking about in terms of someone's a fit, are we looking at their skill set or are we looking at something else? But there are other themes as well. One of the themes could be, are we also not looking into certain degree programs or certain regions and not getting enough applicants from certain backgrounds? And also a related theme, think about the environment in your organization. Is that environment accepting and open to members of various backgrounds? And once again, this focus here was related to Black women in engineering slash STEM. As far as the conclusion, I'd like to say thank you for listening to our panel and two action items, join the African-American Affinity Group or volunteer to serve on the leadership team of the African-American Affinity Group. And actually there's one more action item. Thank you for attending today's presentation. Your time, attention, and participation is appreciated. Please utilize our opportunity to take in as much as possible. Presentations, inspirational insight sessions, keynotes, and networking lounge are all here to make you better both in and out of work. Please aspire to inspire and enjoy WE21. We hope to see you all in person in years to come. Thank you for your time. And please provide us with feedback by scanning this QR code that's on the slide. Thank you once again. Take care and enjoy WE21. Stop me to share. Stop recording.